For many couples who are married, the moment of the proposal, the engagement, is a most meaningful moment. I've certainly never forgotten ours. That evening in mid-November of 1986, top floor restaurant in a nice hotel, Austin, Texas, overlooking the Colorado River, that evening when Anita said yes. Precious moment in our life together. But I discovered that not every proposal is quite so precious or even romantic. I discovered that by getting on my computer and typing into my Google search bar funny proposal stories. Well, a lot of the ones who came up I can't share with you here. But there were some interesting ones. For example, the woman who wrote in and said, my husband proposed to me in an email. Can you imagine? Or what about the man who said, I took my wife, this was before they were married, I took my wife deer hunting. We were out in the woods, seated on a log, freezing to death, huddling together for warmth, and it just seemed like the right thing to say. So I said to her, you want to get married? She said, yeah. He said that was 37 years ago, and she's never gone deer hunting with me again. <laughs> Can you blame her? Or what about these two? The woman who writes in and says, while working at an Italian restaurant, a guy asked if we could bring a ring and flowers out to his girlfriend on a tray for him to propose during dinner. That's a romantic setting, right? My manager excitingly came out and placed it on a couple's table. The woman was ecstatic, but the man was in sheer horror. It was the wrong table. <laughs> we all had to awkwardly watch as the correct groom walked over and claimed his ring from a very upset woman. The rest of the proposal was overshadowed by the crying of that woman and her boyfriend trying to explain that he just didn't see that future for them. Needless to say, no amount of free dinners was fixing that mess. <laughs> and then finally, how about this for romance? She writes, We were just sitting around watching TV and he looked at me and said, Want to get married? We can totally write it off on taxes. It's extra money. So that's how I was proposed to. We eloped and didn't tell anyone till we were coming back from the beach where we eloped to. Oh, the romance. <laughs> So maybe not everybody's proposal story is romantic or special, but for most it is. I've been thinking about proposal stories this week because of where we are in this saga of anguish and joy. As we come to Act 3, we come to a proposal story. It is Ruth proposing to Boaz. I've been thinking about what it is that we actually ask in a proposal moment. Aren't we asking for this other person to join their lives with ours? Aren't we asking for them to cover us with their embrace? Aren't we asked, could the two of us be one, not just now, but forever? Is that what Ruth was asking? Now, you have to remember the deeply vulnerable position in which Ruth found herself. And not only Ruth, the widow, but her mother-in-law, Naomi, another widow. Maybe to get a sense of exactly what that meant in their day and time, we should consider the words of Old Testament scholar John Walton. Listen to what Walton writes about the situation in which Ruth and Naomi find themselves. Walton says, The hazards of widowhood in antiquity were great. In most rural areas, women had little, oppor women had little opportunity to pursue independent careers, but overwhelmingly depended on their husbands for sustenance. Women certainly had significant roles in their household, but these usually did not extend to commercial enterprises, contrary to the idealized description of the noble woman of Proverbs 31. After her husband's death, normally a widow had to rely on her sons for support. If she had none, she might have to sell herself into slavery, resort to prostitution, or die. An extremely vulnerable position. That's where Ruth and Naomi are. Now, when the curtain fell on Act 2 last week, we saw that they were still living together and that the harvest, which had been providing for their needs, was drawing to a close. They were living by faith. They must have had questions. What do we do next? 
Where will our sustenance come from? Who will provide for us? How are we going to survive? Very vulnerable. So it should be no surprise this week as the act rises, as the curtain rises rather on act three, to find that Naomi has come up with a plan. She's been thinking, she's apparently roused herself out of her indolence and grief, and now she has a plan. Ruth chapter 3 lets us in on the plan Naomi has for Ruth. Beginning with verse 1, it says, One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, that is to Ruth, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. Now, there are some stories, some passages in Scripture, the which when we read them, we realize how big a distance exists between the world of the Bible and our world. This is one of those passages. There are at least three elements we have to understand if we're going to understand what happens in this act. So let's address those three. Three ways in which the distance is great and an understanding of the world and culture of the Bible will help us. The first has to do with the role of family. Family was the basic unit of society in the world of Ruth and Naomi. Family was extremely important. Now, we say family is important in our day and time, and it absolutely is, but probably not to the degree which it was in the world of antiquity and certainly in the world of ancient Israel. It was not only the basic unit, but you did everything necessary to maintain that connection and to protect that family. The role of family was key. That's the first element. The second element which grows out of the importance of family is something called the Leverite marriage law. Here's how it worked. If a man died, leaving no child, no son specifically, then his brother would get his widow pregnant, and when a child, a son, was born, that son would be raised in the deceased brother's name. Now, this wasn't some kind of romantic act, as in a wife saying, Honey, your, your brother died. Please deal with his... No, no, no. It wasn't that at all. What drove this was the inheritance, the land that got passed down through the family line, other belongings and possess possessions that got passed along. That needed to be kept in that family, and they needed to maintain that family line alive. Now, it is true that a brother-in-law might refuse to do that, because to do so, he did so at some cost to himself. Just think about it. If his deceased brother had no sons, then that property, those possessions, would revert to him. But if he raised up a son for his brother, it would go to that child. So there were known cases where they refused to do that. In fact, listen to these words from Eerdmann's Bible Dictionary. The brother had the option of refusing to take his sister-in-law and live a right marriage. If this happened, the widow made a public declaration to the city's elders who would attempt to change the brother's mind. If they were unsuccessful, the woman removed one of the brother's sandals and spat in his face to signify that he was derelict in his duty. Now, Ruth has no brother-in-law because he too died in Moab. So that duty will pass to the next of kin. That's the second element we have to understand. The third element, not just the role of family, not just the leave right marriage, but the third element is something called the goel. It's a Hebrew term. Because of the importance of family, anytime something went wrong, anytime something threatened the family's health or well-being or solidarity, the goel was the person who stepped in to set things right. Again, maybe a statement from 
An Old Testament scholar, this time K. Lawson Younger, will help us get some context for what the goel meant and was. He writes, a kinsman redeemer, was that is the goel, was the nearest adult male blood relative who served as an advocate for any vulnerable and or unfortunate clan member in order to correct any disruption to clan wholeness, well-being, or shalom. You know that Hebrew word, that's peace and, and wholeness. Especially through the redemption or restoration of property, persons, or lineage. Since there is no similar institution in modern Western societies, there is no word in English remotely equivalent. Moreover, while similar social functionaries are attested to in other tribal cultures, the terminology associated with the goel is almost exclusively Hebrew, and its basic meaning of redeem, buy back, recover, restore, is derived from its use in the law and custom of the Israelite clans. That's the goel. That male blood relative who stepped in to set things right. Now in the case of both of these, the Leverite marriage and the goel, it was voluntary. While there might have been requirements calling on them to do it, they could refuse to do so because to do so was often costly to themselves. So when that moment came in which that was required, such as it is now with Ruth and Naomi and potentially Boaz, there's a key question that gets raised. And that question is this. Does that nearest male blood relative have hesed? You remember that word from last week's act? Hesed. That's that covenant love, covenant faithfulness, other-centered loyalty, willingness to act at cost to oneself, willing to take the initiative. Will Boaz have Chesed. Will he act on behalf of Ruth and Naomi? It's midnight at the threshing floor. Ruth is carefully following the instructions that her mother-in-law, Naomi, gave to her. Let's go back to the story. Ruth chapter 3, this time we will begin in verse 6. So she went, again, that's Ruth, so she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I'm your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a family guardian. That's that Hebrew word, goel. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness, that's the Hebrew word, hesed. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after young, the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for, do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a family guardian, a goel, there is another who is more closely related than I. Wonder why he hasn't taken action. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your goel, as your family guardian, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. She makes the proposal. In a very odd way to our way of thinking. Very strange situation. 
one that quite honestly has sexual overtones lingering in the air. The key request is found in verse 9. It's where she says to Boaz, Would you spread your covering over me? Spread your garment over me. Spread your robe over me. It's an interesting word in the original because it's the same word found in the previous chapter in verse 12 where Boaz, this time they're out in the field, Boaz talking to Ruth says, You have come to Moab and I hope that having come that you now find in Yahweh that he will draw you under his wings of protection. Same word. Now, Ruth is speaking it to Boaz. Would you spread your wings over me? Would you cover me? Would you redeem me? That's the key question of the entire book. In fact, honestly, that's the key question of this entire book. To those who are destitute, demoralized, despondent, defeated, in need of provision for their future, in need of redemption. The question to our Goel is, will you cover us with your wings? Will you place your robe of righteousness over us? Will you redeem us? That's the question of this book. From beginning to end. You find it in the beginning there. Adam and Eve fleeing away from God. Adam! Oh God, we, we, we are naked, we are uncovered. So we hid. Can you sense in those words, Adam asking, will you cover us? Will you shelter us? Will you redeem us? Or listen to David in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Can you hear it in those words? Oh God, shelter me under your wings. Cover me with your robe. Hide your eyes from what I have done. Redeem me. You hear it in the words of the people of Micah's day, people who say, our sins are great, our iniquities are profound. Oh God, would you not cast them, hurl them into the depths of the sea? Can you hear it in their plea? Oh God, cover us. Cover us with your robe. Shelter us with your wings. Redeem us. And what about the myriad requests that came to that itinerant Galilean rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus, save me. Jesus, I want to see. Jesus, can you make me clean? Jesus, can you come and heal my daughter? Jesus, the boat is about to go down. Don't you care if we drown? Over and over again, the request came in all kinds of different statements, in all kinds of different words. But at the core, from destitute, despondent, demoralized people with no future, wasn't the plea, oh Jesus, won't you cover us with your wings, spread your robe over us? And what of the parable Jesus told of that great banquet, a banquet we understand to be one that has eschatological implications coming at the end of time where a robe is provided for those who enter and those without the robe, well, 
doesn't go so well for them. Isn't the plea in that to us? Here's my robe. Use it. I'll cover you. So that finally in Revelation, it is reported that fine linen, white and bright, is given to the saints to wear. Isn't that the result of the robe He's provided us? And so when Ruth makes her proposal, her plea at midnight on the threshing floor, cover me, guard me, shield me, Redeem me. It is not just the request of her heart, but she gives voice to a numberless throng of others who throughout time have pled with God for covering, for grace, for mercy, for protection, for redemption. And that's what Ruth asks of Boaz. Will he have the hesed? the loving faithfulness to respond. But before we leave that scene of the story, I have to share just one more quote because it is a provocative scene. Listen to these words from K. Lawson Younger once again, Old Testament scholar. He writes, there is no doubt that this scene on the threshing floor is sexually provocative. In fact, honestly, in the original, it has sexually suggestive language. Back to Lawson Younger's words. But the narrator constantly and consistently depicts both Ruth and Boaz as individuals of unmatched integrity whose lives exhibit that faithful loyalty to relationships described by the Hebrew word hesed. It is evidence that his silence means to imply here that they meet this moment of choice with the same integrity. So the question lingers in the air. Boaz, you're a kinsman. You can do the Leverite marriage law. You can be the Goel. Will you act? Will you provide rescue and redemption? Back to Ruth, chapter 3. This time, the last verses of the chapter, the last words of Act 3, starting in verse 16. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, He gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until this matter is settled today. I usually spend my time in five different translations of Scripture as I do sermon prep work all the way from what's called formal equivalence, the formal translations, over to what's called paraphrase. In every one of those five translations, the last word of this scene, Act 3, the last word of this chapter is identical. It's the word today. So our question is, boys, will you act? Will you redeem? Naomi's answer is, he won't rest. He will act today. 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 For you who are destitute, demoralized, depressed, crying out to God, Oh God, shelter me beneath your wings. Cover me with your garment. Do you know the main answer to that? Today. Today that will happen. He will not rest until he responds today. And Naomi, whether knowing him through family circles or having just listened to how he's already treated Ruth or even looking at the six measures of barley that she and her widowed daughter-in-law now have to provide for themselves, she says with conviction, he won't rest. Today he will act. 
I am privileged to lead a group that plans an annual special event here at Loma Linda. It's actually sponsored by Loma Linda University Health. It's an annual clergy appreciation breakfast. Loma Linda University Health has a, has a network of area clergy from all denominations with whom we nurture a relationship hoping to provide blessings that we have that might help improve the health and well-being of their parishes. Each year we have a guest speaker. Two or three years ago, we had Father Greg Boyd from Homeboy Industries down in East Los Angeles, a place where he works with former and current gang members doing the work of Jesus. As we listened to Father Greg that morning, the tears flowed. We were all trying to hide them, embarrassed, but the stories were stirring. I suppose it's for that reason that when I finished his second book the other day, I was so captured again by the stories. The name of the book is Barking to the Choir. He drew that name from a young man, former gang member named Ramon, who was acting out. In fact, Father Greg says he needed an attitudectomy. And so he was confronting Ramon. And Ramon, in trying to get Father Greg to back down and to back off, kind of got his metaphors mixed up. You know, the metaphors, barking up the wrong tree and preaching to the choir. And so as Father Greg confronted Ramon, Ramon said to him, Father Greg, it's no big deal. Back off. You're, you're, you're barking to the choir. <laughs> and Greg Boy thought, that's the name of my next book. Well, it's in that book that Boyd tells the story of Lethe. I want to read it to you in his words. Lethe, he says, a homegirl who has been through the ringer and then back again, sits snug up to the front of my desk. Name any horrific, terrible thing that could befall a human being, and it's befallen her. Prison, drug addiction, domestic violence, kids taken away, it would be a far shorter list if you wrote down the horrific things that haven't happened to her. In fact, I can't think of anything. I would have not survived one day in her childhood. She's asking me for some help when she suddenly says, I wish you were God. I laugh. But I see that Letty, a famous Chiyona, crybaby, is starting to well up. Why do you wish I was God, I ask? She needs time here for composure, not composition of thought. Because, she says, I think you'd let me into heaven. This blindsides me, and now I become the crybaby. I need my time to formulate a response as my eyes moisten. I grab her hands and pull her as close as I can across the top of my desk. I look her in the eyes. We are both crying. We gaze at each other for a very long time. Let the eye begin. I swear to you, if I get to heaven and you're not there, I'm not staying. Do you know what the good news is? The good news for Letty, for Father Greg, the good news for me, the very good news for you. The good news is God will cover us with his wings. God will cloak us in his garment of grace, clothe us in his robe of righteousness. God will redeem us. So to all the Ruths of the world, the response is simple and immediate. The good news is clear. God will cover you. God will grace you. God will embrace you in the garment of His grace, and you will be home.